everyone and welcome back to the Secret Sunday session. Today I am joined by Grant Patterson, aka Scooter. Uh, thank you so much for jumping on the podcast today, Grant, especially with the hectic schedule leading up to Paris. Um, firstly, congratulations. So we know that you got a ticket to go there. Um, welcome. How are you feeling? Well, thanks very much for having me. Um, I'm feeling very um, excited. Um, off to my third Paralympic Games. It's a long time in the making, um, but you know, it's not over yet. We've still got about eight to 10 weeks of hard work in the pool and the gym uh, before we head over. So a lot of prep work before. Mm, I would only imagine. Um, now, before we get into it and discuss obviously your Paralympic journey, um, for those people that are not aware of who you are, who is Grant, who is Scooter, who is he and what does he do with himself? Well, obviously, Grant Scooter Patterson, my nickname is Scooter because I get around on a three wheel trike. Um, I have a, a rare form of dwarfism called diastrophic dysplasia, hence why I get around on a bike because I can't walk. Um, and that pretty much leaves me with um, curved spine, lack of cartilage in all my joints. Um, yeah, you'd say not a very uh, exciting hand if you're playing a game of cards in a poker game. Uh, but I like to say challenging hand. Um, and then obviously now I've got the special privilege of saying I'm a, a three-time Paralympian. I was just made my third Paralympics last week. Um, also dual Paralympic medalist from Tokyo. Um, and yeah, I'm 35 and live up in sunny North Queensland in Cairns. Um, and yeah, work full time, have a house. And I, I do everything that everyone else does. I remember mm -hmm. when I left high school, um, one of my main goals was to fit into society. Um, and I think I've done that really well. Um, and I continue to break boundaries and leap over obstacles. That's so interesting when you especially use that term as in to fit into society when normally a lot of us will go, well, we want, we don't want people to fit in. We want people to stand out. Mm. But for someone that like yourself, why is that, do you believe, a goal that you've always had? Well, I think the reason being my, my parents have done a great job at bringing me up to be the independent man I am today. Um, and being someone, you know, if you saw me without seeing all my accolades, you know, I've got a pretty severe disability and I can't do much. If you look at, you know, my disorder on Google. Um, but I like to prove everyone wrong. Um, I remember, well, there's plenty of stories, but someone told me I couldn't do an Ironman. I don't know if you know what that is, but um, mm. I did that back in 2015, 70.3. Um, and whenever someone tells me I can't do something, this little crazy mongrel inside <laughs> here has to prove it wrong. Um, but I, I suppose, like, growing up, you know, you get your usual bullies at school and, you know, sometimes it's hard to fit in. But I didn't want to be like... And this is not a nice word, but I didn't want to be a burden to society. Um, I wanted to be able to contribute to society, um, which I think if everyone contributes on this planet, the world would be a better place. There's a lot of freeloaders, and I <laughs> hate freeloaders. Um, but me doing, like, who knows if I'll ever get to my dream of winning a gold medal at the Paralympics, but I think my purpose in life is not just to be this amazing swimming Paralympic hero, but... I use swimming as one of my tools to inspire and motivate the next generation to get out in life and have a crack and to let them know it doesn't matter what shape or size or what colour you are, you can always get out there and you know, set your goals high in the sky and it's up to every one and each of you on how far you're willing to climb to reach them. That's beautiful. And it's such a needed message in the world that we, we're living in today. And we talk about that and there is probably a lot of lack of motivation in terms of probably young leaders that are coming through. And, and a lot of us, sometimes we just accept our limits and we decide that throw in the towel, that's it. We don't want to do anything. You know, we just accept what we have. What was your driving force? I know for you, it was proving people wrong, but what kept you going, kept you getting up every morning and wanting to reach that goal? Well, I'm still chasing that elusive gold medal. Um, and then secondly, I love to get my my swimming coach who I've been with now for about 17 years. 
It's longer than the uh, average marriage in Australia. <laughs> but I'd love to get him on a team. He unfortunately hasn't made a major Australian team as of yet, which sucks, and we're not going to go into details here. But that is my goal, and I said to him when I um, got called to come down for the uh, announcement, you know, I gave him a hug and said, mate, I'm sorry, I don't know what to say other than it sucks, but um, looks like we'll be going for another, well, another four years. So I can try and get him on there. Mm, that's incredible. And to think that you're so selfless in the point that it's not just about you, but it's about an entire team. Why do you think that is so important in training for a sport? I think to be humble and self selfless and grateful is very important. Because, well, one, it makes you a better person. And then, two, I hope to rub off on other people and and get them thinking like that because then, obviously, the world becomes a better place. When all we want to do is want, want, want and go and give back, i would be a pretty pretty horrible place to live in, I think. And, obviously, there is a mixture of both. Um, you know, not everyone is perfect. I'm not saying I'm perfect or anything. Um, but, you know, that's part of life. Everyone is different. Everyone's been brought up a different way. I always say that I'm I'm very lucky having the parents I have. Um, and I always say that my parents' chances of winning the lottery is out the window because they got me instead. <laughs> That's a great one. I'm going to use that with my parents now. Yeah. In terms of, you know, looking at your childhood and how you were brought up, was it, difficult um you did mention there that you did experience some bullying how did you navigate that and how did that affect you yeah it was bullying um so but my parents you know gave me good advice and said you know this is going to be part of your life for the rest of your life um and if you're not able to deal with it you're going to crash and burn but if you can find a way around it um, as in being smart and tactful, um, it'll make you a better person and you won't be, you know, that gr uh, sad, grumpy dwarf for the rest of your life instead of being that, I'll be happy, which I'm happy. Um, mm. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of short people out there, dwarfs, whatever you want to call ourselves, uh, but don't like the word midget. I don't, I don't care about words. You know, that old saying, sticks and stones may hurt your bones, but words will never hurt you. Obviously, if someone's teasing you using a derogative name or whatever, well, that's not very nice. But in saying that, it doesn't mean you have to sit there and be sad about it and, and so on. Like, ignore the person and move on and do something else. And I was giving an example to another good friend of mine who's short statured. And I don't want to sound like I'm big nerdy myself, but for example, myself, when I walk down the street of Cairns, after, after Channel 9 did such an awesome job last week, it was happening at the Brisbane airport. But when I walk down, out in public at the airport or whatever, you know, I don't get, because I used to get, oh, look, there's that, before I started swimming, I was fat, and I used to get, oh, look at that fat baby or whatever. Um, but now, because I've been so focused on doing something awesome in life, as in getting on the Paralympic swim team, when people see me, if they haven't seen, you know, when they're seeing the news, they come up and go, oh, oh mum, look at that. Look, that's that fellow, that scooter off the, off the, on the TV, he's a Paralympian or something. You know, instead of me focusing on all the negatives when I was younger, I was focusing on what can I do? How can I be someone, like I said, to contribute to society? Look what the outcome is. How much time would I have been wasting if I sat there and said, Oh, that's not what you meant to call me. And, you know, ring up current affair and complain about, oh, this fella took a photo, or this fella called me a midget, or Rrr. like, forget about it. Like, today, tomorrow's another day, you know, focus on your lane. And that's pretty much what I do in the swimming, focus on my lane. Because you worry about other people, and you're wasting your time on getting to your end goal. I love that. That's such an important message. And, in saying that, do you think that that is almost everything wrong with society? The fact that, you know, when you weren't 
a Paralympic swimmer, when you weren't in the pool, when you didn't have that stature around you, people would judge, people would label. And now it's because you have this title and, and you are out there that people view that a little bit differently. Yeah. Well, well, one, it shows that someone like me can do something awesome. And, and then two, it shows don't waste your, your positive energy on things that you can't control. I, I talk about that in my motivational speaking, controlling the uncontrollable. Mm-hmm. You can't control some things in life. Let it go. Focus mm-hmm. on you. Mm-hmm. What does letting go look like? Because I think a lot of people want What's to be able to let go. <laughs> let it go, let it... Yeah. Oh, sorry, keep going. Um, you got me distracted there. Now I've got Elsa in my head. Um, <laughs> what is, yeah, what does letting go look like? Because for some people, they really want to be able to let go, whether that be anything, whether it be, you know, comments, whether it be relationships, whether it be other people but they don't know how to put things into practice. For you, what has worked in terms of being able to just water off a duck's back? I'll give you an example, but it's pretty much ignoring the thing that's bothering you. Um, But for example, I'll be walking in the shopping centre with a friend, an old friend, and everyone looks at me all the time anyway because I get around on a three-wheel trike and I'm a short fella, Um, and people stare. Um, and a lot of my mates, this was probably earlier on, obviously people look now because I'm a fella on the TV and doing swimming, but um, but people share and all that stuff, and, and a lot of my close mates, would, they would get worried and, and sort of protective, and, and they would look back at them and say, oh, what are you looking at, you know? And I would have to tell them, I said, mate, just let it go. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I said, let them stare. How often do you see a midget rolling down a shopping centre on a three-wheel trike? Ever. Well, mm-hmm. there you go. It's like there's an alien in town. If mm-hmm. there was an alien walking through the street, I'd be staring at it too. <laughs> um, but obviously I'm so, what's the right word, adaptive and used to those behaviours around me and what I said before, I don't let it get to me. It's just part of society. Mm-hmm. If people want to stare or have a look, go for it. Take a photo. Mm-hmm. But I, I like when people come ask me a question and, you know, some some good parents will come up and say, oh, little Johnny, uh, say hello. And, you know, if you have a question, ask him. And I'm more than happy to talk to the person and, and tell them that I was stuck in a crocodile's mouth and lost my arms and legs. And, <laughs> You know, make a joke. Yeah, make a joke about it too. Make, make yeah. a, oh, and then tell the real story. That's all about what you know. I've just mm. taken them on a roller coaster in a minute, and I've made their day. And and then all of a sudden, they're going home, going, "Oh, maybe I shouldn't worry about little Johnny calling me a redhead at school." You know, because Scooter doesn't care. He just cruises around and does his thing. Mm. And that's I want to put it. I'm not saying go out and tease people, but I'm saying people that. Might get called names or something. Don't worry about it. Focus on your lane and do your thing. Mm. So I just don't take life too seriously as well. Just right. have fun with it. Because life's very short. Look at me. I'm very short. <laughs> I've got to stop laughing. You keep making me laugh. I'm getting off track. Really? Life's all about <laughs> laughter. No, it really is. And, I mean, you're in a really serious sport as well. How do you bring fun into it? And how do you bring fun into training and downtime and enjoying life? I'll just be me. <laughs> um, what well, like I just said, you know, life, life's too short. Don't take it serious. Um, and you've got to enjoy it. Obviously, you know, I do seven swim sessions a week and two gym sessions. There's um, a big part of that where it's not fun and games. You know, I'm being serious because I want to do well obviously, to make the Paralympic team, and then I want to do well to represent my country at the Paralympics. Um, but obviously, before and after, and, and you know, different times of the day, there's times to have a joke and have a play, and then there's also times to be serious. Um, and I remember one thing that me, uh, my granddad said a long time ago, um, if, you, if you're having more fun than working hard, you're not doing it right. So there is a... a balance there uh, but mm. it's also to have it's important to have some fun as well mm. do you feel like you're a different person when you're inside of the pool compared to being out of the pool 
No, I'm the same. And I think that's why people can relate and enjoy me so much because I'm so easy to get along with. You don't have to step on eggshells around me like, oh, students here, I can't say the N word or, you know, because I just, I love life so much and I'm so grateful for the journey I've been on and still on. Um, and I just want to keep doing what I'm doing and help others be happy mm. in life, achieve their goals. It sounds really hard to believe that you could have a bad day. Um, but do you, do you still have those days where it's just all a bit too much? Yeah, it, it's interesting to say that because there are days I have bad, but because I've learned so much through my swimming career, resilience-wise, I move on so quickly. Mm. And like, I'll give you an example. Last year, I missed out on Worlds. wasn't fast enough. Pardon me. And I mean, I'm not real proud of it, but I was an naughty boy in my car. And I, I got suspended my license anyway so that happened last year in april all at one at one point and i remember obviously coming back from trials and i said oh you know this sucks you know suspended car license um not on the world champ team this is a shit year i was like oh well you know what have we learned throughout my swimming career and for example 2016 i missed out on the rio paralympics um and i remember back then all i wanted to do was scream and shout about you know the paralympic classification system is crap and um, not fair and i remember my parents saying "Grant, you've got two options you can um bring up current affair and scream out how yeah, horrible it is and blah, 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 and be known for that, that fellow that cried about the classification system or two, you can shut the hell up, get back to work in your pool and a gym, not knowing if your chance of making another team again will happen, and sure as hell not knowing if you'll ever get the chance to win that elusive Paralympic medal. And look what happened. Mm. I, shut, I focused on myself and I went back to work. Those Paralympic medals in Tokyo 2021, that took 13 years of dedication, hard work, blah, 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 all of the above to get there. And and that whole story going to, well, missing out Beijing, went to London, missed out on Rio and come back, like that story in itself is probably on par for gold medal performance. You know what I mean? I don't want a gold medal yet, but yeah. I've got a killer of the journey. Yeah. Um, and actually experiencing that helped me with last year um, where I just got back on top, went back to work, went back to training um, and did the best I could knowing that Paris is only 12 months, uh, Paris trials are 12 months around the corner, let's get to work. Mm. And that's what I did, get back to work because there's what? no point worrying about the stuff that you can't control, remember? Focus on mm. what you can control. And what I could control at the time was training to be better in the pool and coming back stronger, which mm. happened. Incredible. What a journey. And even to put that into perspective of 13 years of hard work, how do you stay patient and set on the goal? Because a lot of us look at that and we're like, oh, we want results at the end of the year. We want results in a week's time. We want that turnover. We look at that in our business. We look at that in everything in life. How do you stay in your lane knowing that, yeah, it, the results could come 13 years down the track? Um, I know your persistence, dedicated, dedication, I'm motivated. Um, and obviously, you know, I want to I wanna get chase that elusive gold medal and get my coach Herbie on the team, I guess. And that's a, two massive goals for me to achieve. Who knows if they'll ever happen? But, you know, while I enjoy training so much, why well, stop? Mm, that's right. If you enjoy it. Oh, training. It sounds like so intense, though. Does it hurt on your body at all? Uh, yeah. So back to when I was telling you about my diastrophic dysplasia, blah, 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 lack of cartilage in all the joints. I pretty much got the body of like a 60 or 70 year old. So I'm sort of adapted to a small portion of arthritis in a way, but as of late, like the last year or two, 
it's sort of, you know, not very comfortable. And when I wake up early in the morning, especially in winter, the body doesn't want to move, the back's stiff, and sometimes your hip might go out of place, like, ah! <laughs> and, you know, of course, I've um, talked to my coach and my PT and was penciled in 2032, pencil, not pen, pencil. Um, and I think that dream is going to be harder and harder to achieve because at the moment, you know, I could nearly finish finish this year, but no, I'm still still hungry to do more after this year. Mm. Why do you want to keep on going? Like what? Because I'm mad. I'm crazy. <laughs> I think we established that. We established that you're mad and you're crazy. But does 2032 in Brisbane, does that mean something to you? I think if I could make it till then, that would be the icing of the cake of all time. Um mm -hmm your home games, you know, sort of well-known already, but, like, it'd be epic. Um, mm. One of my good friends, Ellie uh, Simmons, she's a British Paralympic swimmer, and her big one was London 2012. She was only young back then as well. Um, and, you know, I talked to her. she came come over to my place last year, and she said, if you're up for it and, you know, you've still got the passion and hunger, yeah, not, nothing beats your home games. And, you know, not many people get the chance to be competing when it's, you know, available. The last time it happened was 2000. Mm. And you know, I'm going to be waiting, you know, it's 32 years from 2000 to then. If I make 2032, I'll be 43. I'm literally oh. a living dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's got from Jurassic Park, I reckon. <laughs> You'll still make the pool. You'll make it somehow. There'll be some way that you'll make it. I can feel the determination and motivation in you that you'll you'll get there no matter what. If you if you have that drive, I find that you'll make that pool. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the most important thing. I feel like that's the whole cause of this whole podcast is you just got to give it a go. Um, but we talk about the Paralympics and you can't wipe people's smiles off their faces, no matter what you say, no matter what ad you watch, what music's playing. When you turn on the television, the feeling that you get when you are watching a games is phenomenal. What feeling does it give you? Well, I think, you know, the Olympics is really amazing to watch. I've always watched that my whole life. But then the Paralympics, it's the same as the Olympics, but if not, it sounds horrible to say this, I don't mean it in any bad way, but if anything, it's more inspiring and motivating because you've got people, flesh and blood, with a big heart, doing the same sort of training regimes, but with a physical challenge they have to overcome as well as doing all the hard work in the pool, the track, or whatever sport they do. Um, so I think it gives you even... Uh, a more of a special feeling and you know it really hit home for me after Tokyo because I had a lot of people reach out to me and congratulate me but I also had a lot of well not heaps but a few people like myself it was mainly little kids like their parents would reach out and say oh yeah uh, Scooter thanks for doing what you're doing you know you've inspired my younger son or daughter to do you know, great things in life because they're similar to me. And, you know, when you've got a baby with diastrophic, dis diastrophic dis uh, dysplasia and you don't know anything about it, it looks pretty grim <laughs> because when my parents had me, they said, oh, is you're going to walk or talk or, you know, all of the above. The doctors scared the hell out of you. Um, and to go from that point 35 or 34 and a half years ago to now, you know, I'm in my own house, have a job, three times probably been, blah, 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 blah. You know, it's like, wow. And, you know, you've got people out there farms and legs and we're lucky to achieve a quarter of that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I'm very grateful and I'm very grateful for the journey I've had. And, you know, I often tell my parents, I said, you know, I don't think I'd want it any other way because... You know, I might not be the same inspiring and motivating person if I had all my arms and legs. Who knows what could have happened? I said, this mm. journey has been pretty amazing. Mm. Um, you know, I feel very grateful and humbled to be able to say I'm a, a Paralympian um, because, you know, I'm just trying to create stories to inspire 
the next generation to do the same thing what I'm doing. That's so beautiful. And I love that, that you're trying to inspire and, and motivate. And I completely think that you are. Do you find that you inspire and motivate yourself? Uh, I don't know. I, I understand the power I have. I like using a Spider-Man quote all the time. Um, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> um, but um, obviously, I see how I do, but myself, you know, I just, I just think I'm like you. You know, you woke up this morning, did whatever you did, and now you're on a, a call talking to me because you're trying to, to make this podcast, TV series, or whatever you're doing to help people be inspired and motivated to do better. I, guessing. Yeah. Um, I just feel the same as everyone else. But I do understand the impact I have being the person I am. Hence why I do a lot of motivational speaking. Mm, yeah. And then if it's not yourself, then who aspires, inspires you? Well, let me just say I look up to everyone, even you. Oh, why? Why is that? No, oh, yeah. okay, right. I got you it. I was in the there. <laughs> I was a bit delayed there. I look up to everyone. Oh, goodness gracious me. I think, you know, what I really like is I like seeing stories of compassion, like Mm -hmm. Kate Campbell doing an amazing job over her past four Olympic um, eras. Mm -hmm. Roger Federer doing what he's done for the sport and Rafa Nadal. Yeah, not even, I like tennis, but I'm not a, a tennis lovable fan, but like, I I love seeing those stories how athletes pretty much give themselves to the sport and, and what they're doing is inspiring and motivating the, the next generation, giving yeah, giving young kids to something to aspire to be, you know what I mean? Like that is so powerful. And, and there's not many people out there that do it. And if I can try and do something, yeah, you know, at least half of what they've done, I'd be pretty happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you are. I think you really are paving the way in not just sport, but in for people all around the world. Um, and it's honestly, it is so inspiring. And talking, I guess, about the Paralympics and that big build up. I mean, we talk about, yeah, there's a four week, a four year, sorry, training stint. Um, sometimes it's even longer, as we mentioned. But when you reach the games, as we said, massive build up, all to the one moment, and then it's over until the next thing what how do you cope with the come down after that big build up all the training all the hard work and then it's just done it is it is pretty tricky for me and when you're a young a young athlete rookie i think it's very hard because you know the lead up to it everyone treats you like the king and when you're over there everyone's powdering your bum <laughs> your yeah. bee's knees <laughs> Yeah. Um, and then you come back and going into society, you know, it, it's different. And also it depends on, you know, what choices you make and, and the things to uh, keep you on that level in that stratosphere or, you know, depending on, you know, when you come down, how you adapt to the real world. And I think I'm lucky away, obviously, back to my parents. Thanks for having them because they've taught me heaps of lessons and also you know keeping me on the ground not that i can leave that far because i'm pretty short um but i work full time and i think you know being a paralympic athlete it's very hard to just do your sport because paralympics is it's getting better but it's not as big as say the olympics and obviously other professional sports where you know you get big sponsorship deals and you know you can just focus on your sport that would be a dream of mine to be able to do that. But in saying that, I think I'm much better off resilience-wise and also coming back down to earth after the Paralympics because I know what it's like to deal with you know, customers and, and and mundane work. You know, working a nine, an eight to five job during the week. I've, I've been there for nine years now. Um, you know, it's, it's very hard and, and that's probably just as much challenging sometimes as doing your sporting career. Um, but I think that's a big key to helping me stay grounded. Um, obviously, as Paris gets closer, I'm wanting to 
hope we maybe get into commentary or do something like that. Um, so I'm hoping to lift my wings and, and stay in the stratosphere this time because obviously Tokyo happened and it was really good. You know, I did a lot more talks when I got home, but I uh, come back down and landed on the ground pretty quickly. Um, but this time, yeah, I'm just trying to make use of all the opportunities I get. Um, put myself out there. You know, I'm doing this thing with you right now. Every opportunity I get, you know, have a crack. Um, because, you know, that's only going to put me in a, a better position after Paralympic Games, Paris. Mm, that's awesome. Are you excited to go to Paris? Yes. <laughs> Have you been to Europe? Uh, yes, but I haven't been to Paris. Mm, nice. Is it a different feel when you go there? Obviously, you're not going there for a holiday, but when you're going there, do you find that you put your blinkers on and you switch off and you've got to be kind of serious? Yes, a lot, of, a lot of friends and family say, oh, you know, you're so lucky you get to go on all these holidays. Like, no, 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 <laughs> it's not a holiday. And I was talking to my coach about this in the car when we were going to the finals last week. And I said, I think I'm starting to understand why athletes retire, you know, a, a big part of it. And I think a big part of it is I mean, the mental game that we put on ourselves before a main event like trials, like before I had my 50 breaststroke, I'm good at dealing with stuff and I've dealt with it for the last 17 years, but it still happens. It's still that feeling inside. What if I don't make it? What will happen? You know, what will I do? What will I do then? You know? And and thinking of that, that, that whole little process there that goes on for like, I don't know, two to three days, it's horrible. <laughs> And after you do your swim and get your time, it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. um, but that, that little thing there I just explained is, yeah, it's very challenging. And when you're a younger athlete, it can destroy you. You know, mm. like when I missed out on, well, it didn't hurt me as much because I only got back in the water in 2007, mid-2007, and then, Six months later, Beijing trials, 08 in April, and I missed out by one and a half seconds, but, but I'd only been training for six months, so it wasn't so much of a, a big impact compared to, you know, making London four years later and then coming back, you know, wanting to do better at Rio, not just make the team, but I wanted to win a medal. Meanwhile, I didn't even go on the plane. <laughs> I stayed back home. Oh, how do you... Yeah. Yeah, on the distance, and you see the plane going, you just at yeah. the airport side. What like little Tim? Tim. <laughs> oh, um, how do you know? Or how do you think you will know when you're going to retire? Do you think that you're going to have a feeling, or do you think it's going to be more a body thing? Or well, I think it's definitely it's definitely like it sounds weird, but surrounding my head in like a halo for my. <laughs> But because I have that goal of trying to win that elusive gold medal and also get my coach on the team, I'm still focused. Unless the body goes, you know, blows the shoulder, blows the hip, like falls yeah. off. Yeah. I'm, I'm still going for it because while I'm swimming, I'm still fit and healthy and I can do more. A lot of people like me, back to the diastrophic card, um, are bound to wheelchairs, have steel rods on their back, they can't do much. And while I'm fit as Iron Man here, um, I can do a lot more in life. So I actually enjoy the whole training and all that, keeping fit more than I do racing, probably. Oh, really? I'm, yeah, I'm competitive of animal, but I, I like I like the hard work. It's because mm. it keeps me able to be independent. Like, you know, I got my own house here and I mow my own lawn. I'm probably one of very few disabled, or severely disabled people that don't have NDIS. I'm not picking on anyone, but yeah. I'm a very independent person. Mm. And I love my independence. And I think if that was taken away, that would cut me in half. <laughs> yeah. Why is that? Why is that such a strong driver for you to have your own independence? I'll tell you why. When I was, <clears throat> when I finished high school, I was very fat during high school, like Jabba the Hutt of Star Wars. 
had no neck. Anyway, I finished high school and I wanted to lose weight. Um, you know, young boy, you wanted to lose weight, look better for the girls, try and, you know. Anyway, in that time, I was also, so I was swimming for fitness and then I was at TAFE studying computers, which I've done nothing to do with ever since, <laughs> but I was doing something. Yeah. Um, and I remember going into Centrelink to, I don't know, get, make sure I still had the disability pension, obviously, because, you know, it was sort of hard for me to go work at Coles or, you know, as a checkout chick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're falling off the, uh, off the belt. <laughs> um, anyway. Um, oh, I'm going to start crying soon. Yeah, they said, oh, no. You you not you don't qualify for it. I said, what do you mean? You know, you don't my small disabled than this. I can't walk for Christ's sake. Um, anyway, they said, no, you're not able because you do too much with your swimming, your TAFE, and your part-time work. And that was like when I was 18. And I said to myself, I'll never come in here ever again. I'm going to make it my way through life by myself. And I've done it ever since. And I'm, I'm much better off for doing it. Seriously, like, because when you, for example, when I mow my own lawn, I get, like, self-satisfaction out of that. You know, little things like that that you feel proud of. And, you know, you've done it, you've achieved it, uh, you've achieved something that no one else thinks that you can because you're different. Um, little things like that make you feel, I don't know, valued on this planet. And there's a lot of people out there that, sit there doing nothing, scratch your head, so oh, life's not fair. And they're like that because they don't do anything for themselves. They just want everything given to them. And it's so sad. And I think when you see someone like me mowing his horn and I'll like Joe Blow and that's all the farms and legs that makes his wife do it or something like because he's too lazy. He's <laughs> like, what? It's sad. But, that's amazing. So that's me. I, I like being able to do everything myself. Obviously, there's things I can't do, like, you know, reach the strawberry jam up high. <laughs> but when I'm in the shopping centre and if I can't reach something, I'll find someone and say, hey, can I borrow your height? And they're like, huh? <laughs> your height? Oh! And, you know, a bit of a joke, a bit of a yarn, and they grab the strawberry jam off the top and off they go. Um, Incredible. But I remember one time... I was at the checkout putting my stuff up on the conveyor belt and someone and a lot of people like to come up and these are called the over over helping people. And mm. they come up and they want to do everything for you, which is really nice of them to do that. Mm. But sometimes mm. when you've got a person with a disability, it's also good to be able to do it yourself, hence the reason I said before. Anyway, I'll be putting my stuff up on the on the conveyor belt and someone will come in and say, Oh, no, thank you. I'm fine, thanks. You know, I can do it. I like throwing it up there anyway, so like a game. And I said, if you've got spare time, you can come over to my house and mop the floor. I really don't like doing that. And like, oh. <laughs> That's so, I think it's such a great perspective as well, because a lot of the time we do, and you see it in public, as people do want to overhelp. And, yeah. and, but we don't obviously take that, that independence perspective that I think is it's so amazing and so pivotal when you think of like walking into a Centrelink and turning around and never looking back. Yep. Um, <laughs> absolutely incredible. <laughs> that was your turning point, walking into a Centrelink. I absolutely love it. Australian yeah, sure, dream. Yeah, sure started playing, if I could turn back time. <laughs> this is now becoming a musical podcast. Um, yeah. I love it. There is one question before I want to go into some quick questions that I feel like is my big one that I really wanted to ask. But you said that you wanted to do all this. Well, it's not that big, but, you know, it's it's bigger. Um, why swimming? You could have done so many other sports. As you said, you had that motivation and the drive to do whatever you're going to put your mind to. But why decide to get into a pool? There's actually a, a few reasons. Okay. The first one was it was really like um, back when I was little, it was always – a thing that I should get in a pool and swim because it's good for me medically for my back and all my joints to keep me moving. Mm. And to be honest, swimming has been a lifesaver because without swimming, like I was saying before, 
a lot of people like me that don't do any sport um, have rods in their back, steel rods in their back, and they can't move very well. And you know, a lot of them probably have carers because they, you know, they can't c touch their toes because they're so stiff. Or, you know, mm -hmm. um, so that's the main reason medically. Um, two, I've actually tried to do. I tried to do wheelchair tennis after. 2016 when I missed out on Rio, I was yeah. like, you know, because I was pissed off with the classification system, and I said, ah, oh, I'll do tennis because I like I like playing tennis. I like yeah. getting on the ball. I'm not obviously not that good compared to an able bod, but I've never really burst someone in a wheelchair, which is obviously <laughs> slower than an able bod. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I tried to do that, and they're like, oh, if you want to do it competitively, you have to hop in a wheelchair. And I said, how am I meant to do that? I can't reach the wheels. My arms are too short. You know, it'd be a completely, it'd be like, it'd be like telling a, a fellow with no arms to say, oh, come give me a hand. Like, you know. <laughs> so that didn't work. Um, but after Tokyo, I recently got into go-karting. I love speed. Hence mm. me last year losing the suspended license. <laughs> yeah. um, little naughty boy era. Yeah, naughty boy. Um, Dave Kane, well, is to help, you know, fix all that adrenaline um, love that I have. You know, you've got the need for speed. Yeah. Um, so, but I'm definitely a person that likes the outdoors, um, likes the feel of hard work. I think if I was an able boy, I would be playing... AFL or cricket or maybe gymnastics. Yeah. I like being very active. Yeah, um, awesome. yeah, that's why swimming sort of stuck because I wanted to do other stuff. Like I wanted to play AFL when I was a kid, um, but my parents, you know, obviously very honest and and open. You know, Grant, when you're 11 or 12, all these guys are going to start getting bigger and you're going to be stuck on the field going your speed. Um, and I'm pretty sure you don't want people to have me there just because, oh, let's support the little disabled fella. You know, you want to be a part of the thing. You want to contribute. Um, and, you know, obviously you can still have a kick with your mates or whatever at school, at lunch or whatever, which I did all the time at lunch. Um, but playing AFL obviously became more realistic and more... Well, I started to realise that it's probably not going to work. I'm going to get squashed. You know, me head on an AFL field with five, six foot blokes running around, it's not really going to work. But I, in, in different ways, I, um, uh, I remember in grade 11 and 12, I helped out with the AFL school team and I was like the assistant coach slash, you know, hold the board up and put the names on the thing. You know, I was part of the... The team and I helped out and I went away with the trip. So, you know, where I couldn't participate, I found other ways where I could contribute, which I think I'm very proud of me for doing that back then. Absolutely. So. I think once again, you, you saw that there were limits, but you're like, how do I pivot? How do I make my way around this? Correct. Incredible. Um, now my quick questions. They're not. They don't have to be quick. You can uh, answer them as long as you like. You know, because we're we've always got time. Um, but a couple of things I want to ask in terms of obviously your journey and your takeaways. But the first one is, what is the lesson that you feel like you have learnt throughout your entire journey that probably sticks with you the most and motivates you every day? To be patient. Um. And if something doesn't work, you know, go back to the drawing board and, and keep working at it. Um, I've learned a lot about resilience. That's, well, that's a big key, well, a part of me. Um, being able to adapt in circumstances that you might not agree with or approve of. Um, be, and be able to, like what I said earlier on, being able to take a step back, think about it, breathe and think about how we're going to move forward instead of worrying about the disappointment you just found out, what are we going to do next? Mm -hmm. um, those are some big things. And also um, learning how to stop trying and controlling the uncontrollable because sometimes things happen that are out of your control mm -hmm. and if you're trying to change history or things that are out of your control, you're, you're wasting time. So, you know, as, again, as I said before, stay in your lane, 
and go, and do what you can to make you successful or get you closer to your dreams and goals. Incredible. What do you want your legacy to be? Mm. I've been thinking about that a bit lately. And I think my legacy is, you know, to have <laughs> world peace, but also I hope that I've inspired and motivated people to realise that no matter who you are, you can get out there and have a crack in life and have a go. It doesn't matter what shape, size, what colour, but you get out and, and have a crack. Mm, amazing. And if you were someone that was looking at yourself now, what would you say to you? Good work, mate. Keep going. I'm very proud of you. Um, you know, look at the, the, the hang of cards you were dealt at birth. A lot of people would say it's a crap hand. I'd like to say it's a challenging hand. Um, and keep doing what you're doing. Amazing. So inspiring. So inspiring. I can see how you're a motivational speaker. Um, and the last one, with I think your entire journey being wrapped up and, and so beautiful in the sense of where it has led you to where you are today. But we are looking at that big goal in terms of getting the gold. What will it take and what does it take to win that gold? A lot of hard work in the pool and in the gym, you know, working with my uh, support crew, my coach, my PT, family, friends, parents, um, and then also, you know, a huge amount of commitment. It's all about making good choices, but not just good choices once a day, you know, good choices consistently. It's like mm -hmm. playing golf. You know, the winner of the golf tournament is the person who's been the most consistent at hitting a ball in the hole the least amount of times. Mm. So, and it's a bit like a bit like life in general. If you can consistently make good choices in life, you know, do all those little one percenters, you know, sleep, nutrition, train hard, a little bit of socialise to distract the brain from all the work that you do during the week. Um, you know, there's a happy medium there. A lot of people say, how do I, uh, you know, how, how come I'm still swimming for so long? How many you not sick of it? And I said, well, no, because I have a good happy medium of, you know, being social on the weekends too, you know, going out for a movie or well, me out for dinner with some mates. Obviously, I don't get pissed because that's not a good choice, a good performance <laughs> move um, for Monday morning. And it's certainly what we say on the Australian team, not golf and ready. <laughs> Uh, it's all about being golf and ready. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how good. I love it. Absolutely love it. And lastly, I know I said the last one was the last one, but who do you think is going to win the AFL Grand Final? Because I could not uh, ignore the Brisbane Lions jersey in your background, but do you think they're going to make it? Brisbane Lions, well, I really hope that we come back and get into the top eight and then have another crack because last year was such a good game. I was meant to go down to the game, but one of the airlines, I will not name, uh, fail, failed me, so I missed out. You're at the airport again? You are waving at the airport again? Yeah, well, it was fine. See, see, Rio gave me, I remember, I was, that morning, uh, 4.40, I was meant to, well, go on the airplane at 6.30, but wake up at 4.40 to get ready. Got a text message at like 4.45, saying it's been cancelled. And then I madly searched for more flights. This is on the day of the grand final. Nothing. Well, there was something that was like $1,600 and I thought about it and then I went for it and it was gone. Um, and I remember it took like five minutes. I sat there, a bit of a, a bit of a tear to myself because I was going down with my brother and my dad and I bought the tickets. We're all going to have a, a good father and son um, day, day out, it would have been epic, you know, I could just picture yeah. that photo, all of us three at MCG, you know, cheers, um, <laughs> it, it wasn't meant to be, and I actually used a lot of my strengths from like Rio and stuff like that to help me get through it, and I just said, Ryan, it's not your time, something's happened, <laughs> and I know it sucks, Don's balls, but you're not going to Melbourne, <laughs> unless you've got a private jet at the back, which you don't. <laughs> I said, yes, so yeah, I ended up yeah, I ended up giving my ticket away for free to someone in Melbourne. So I was like, well, you know, I've had a shit day. I want to make someone else's day. 
Mm. I give it the, the trip of a, a life, well, the game of a lifetime. I ended up giving it to some sh- silly pie supporter, and they won. <laughs> like, I'm like, how much better could it get? You're gonna free kick it, and your team wins. Like, like who oh. wants time? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, you made his life. So at the end yeah. of the day, you know, you've given back to society once again. Um, just means your time is coming. It's going to come. Um, and you'll be that's there. Doing, that's why I keep doing what I'm doing. Yeah. yeah. Good things right. happen to those who do good things in life. Incredible. They absolutely do. Well, thank you so much for jumping on the podcast today and sharing your story as well as making me laugh so much. I started crying, um, which we love. Um, but where as well can people follow you on your journey if they want to see where you're at, follow you and follow you all the way to Paris? Oh, well, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, it's been great you know, telling my story. Uh, but yeah, if, if people want to follow me on the Instagram or, you know, a student Facebook page. Um, and yeah, I hope that I can inspire and motivate you to do something different. Oh, you definitely have. I know I will take lots of away from it as well. So thank you so much for jumping on today, as I said. And as well to everyone else out there, thank you for joining us for another Secret Sunday session. We'll catch you guys all very soon. Thank you. Oh, 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 oh,